Okay, thank you guys. Um, so this, this program today, uh, we're gonna be talking about high products um, that we're gonna use for health and beauty, uh, not necessarily consumed directly the way we would with honey, um, but some alternate ways that you can use the kind of byproducts of the hive. Uh, and this is gonna be particularly about bee management for these products. It's not gonna be focused on recipes, uh, specific formulas. If you were at our, um, our March 2020 meeting, we had Mary Blue from Pharmacy Herbs. Um, she was talking about, you know, some similar, uh, a similar topic, but more focused on actual uh, recipes and formulas for these. Um, but this is more geared toward beekeeping and uh, hive colony management. Uh, if you want to harvest these products, if you want to increase the, the harvest, the, the production of these products, uh, and some, some things to keep in mind when using these um, specifically for these purposes. Uh, you know, as beekeepers, we kind of, we may look at these, these as um, like a blessing or a curse, you know, like propolis, uh, you know, it's sticky in the summer, uh, but it really has beneficial qualities, not only to the bees, but to humans. Um, but we're gonna talk about today is how specifically to, to maintain those healthy qualities um, for use, you know, in, internally or, you know, cosmetics, supplements, uh, things of that nature, maybe not, um, you know, for other kind of household uses, in other words. Um, so honey is gonna be the first thing we'll talk about. Um, the, the, the four major topics that will be honey, pollen, uh, propolis, and the fourth one, I'm blanking on honey, pollen, propolis, beeswax. Uh, and of course there are other products, uh, you know, royal jelly, uh, bee venom, uh, brood. Uh, those we're going to ignore for today. We'll, we'll deal with the, the major ones. Uh, and I said at the beginning of the meeting, if you guys have questions, feel free to unmute yourselves and just kind of shout it out as we go. If you prefer, you can put it in the chat and we'll get to them later. Um, but without further ado. Okay, so honey. Uh, I mean, this is a quick overview. Most of you guys are going to know this, but what is honey? Uh, basically, it, it, they're plant nectars. They're collected by forager bees. Those foragers add enzymes, they break down the sugars into glucose and fructose, and then the moisture content um, is reduced below 20%. At that point, it gets stored, um, you know, capped over. That's what we consider honey. It's no longer nectar at that point. So honey is the main carbohydrate source uh, for bees. It's the energy source. Uh, so that's what they're going to use for uh, locomotion. That's what they use when they're in cluster in winter uh, to vibrate their flight muscles, to generate the heat that, that keeps the cluster warm. Honey also contains small amounts of vitamins, minerals, enzymes, you know, other kind of trace nutrients that the bees use. And it is also the primary component of beeswax. Um, so again, when, when we're dealing with harvesting honey or beeswax, you're going to be kind of weighing those two. Um, the bees are going to require honey to, to be the raw material to make that wax. Um, so if we're taking a big honey harvest, you may not get a big wax harvest. Um, so something to keep in mind. Okay, so some, some health and beauty benefits. Uh, honey is really, it's, it's an amazing product. Um, I mean, it's, it's one of the oldest um, one of the oldest substances used in healing, um, you, you know, you can find uh, medical formularies going back to, you know, the Pharaoh times uh, and honey is like one of the main components of, you know, a lot of their, their various formulas. It's got antibacterial, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties, um, you know, very powerful healer and, you know, unlike some other high products that I'm going to talk about later, uh, it really has been studied by the medical community and kind of signed off on by the medical community. Uh, we have um, medical doctors in Reba, they're members that have uh, used honey in their, their own practices. Uh, you can be prescribed honey ointment. Uh, so there really is good, um, good science behind this. Uh, it, it promotes a moist wound environment. Uh, 
so tissues will heal faster, uh, less scarring, less scabs. It hydrates and smooths skin, uh, so it's great in ointments and salves, things of that nature. Uh, and it can be used as a sweetener for other medicines. Um, if, if you're, uh, you know, maybe making some kind of a, an herbal concoction that maybe has some bitter qualities, uh, those bitter qualities may be medicinal on their own, but it's not necessarily very palatable. Honey can be added to that to kind of make it a little sweeter. Uh, it's also a great throat soother. Uh, and, you know, you can put that directly just in a cup of tea. Uh, you know, we can we can realize how that works. Uh, it's also great in herbal syrups, uh, which is something I, I have made myself. Uh, and it also has some, some really exciting other possibilities as far as um, mitigating negative effects of chemotherapy, possibly shrinking tumors uh, as a hangover cure. Really, there's like a long laundry list of um, areas that they're investigating the use of honey uh, as, as, a, as a medicine. Okay, so harvesting. Moisture content for USDA grade eight honey is 18.6%. Um, you know, we've kind of been threatening for the last few years to have a, you know, a hands-on demonstration on the best ways to, to harvest and process honey. And it really is something that we need to do because it, those of us who go out and, and see honey on shelves, we're continually baffled by, um, you know, the variation that we see in presentation. And I don't mean color or, or, you know, label artwork. I mean, jars filled in properly, you know, tons of foam in there, debris. Um, so kind of the first main bullet point you want to hit is that 18.6% moisture content. If, you're, uh, if your frames are capped, you can probably safely assume that it's going to be at that moisture level. If not, um, you know, I, I, we were always taught you give it a frame a shake and if the, the nectar doesn't fall out, it's probably ripe. I found that to be very imprecise personally. Uh, I would recommend everyone invest in like a pretty cheap refractometer. Uh, that's something you can get for about $35 on Amazon now. Uh, and just check a few cells. Uh, you know, we, we did our final extraction today and some frames I'd pulled out, you know, they were open frames that the moisture content was too high. Uh, you know, we had them with a dehydrator and a fan blowing on them for a few days. We brought that moisture content down to where they need to be. That's great. I've also seen in the past open frames, uh, you know, where the, where the moisture content was far below 18.6, you know, it was like 16 or in the 15% range. Um, so visual, uh, I, I don't really like that. I, I like to use the refractometer, uh, just gives you a, like a real sense of, um, trust in, in what you're putting out there. Uh, so again, you want to avoid using smoke when you're removing the supers if possible. Uh, you know, excessive smoke could possibly flavor the honey, but you are also going to be potentially introducing, um, you know, flecks, like little black flecks of ash from, from the, the fuel that you're burning, uh, which is not very, very attractive. Spinning out frames. So th there are the two kind of main ways to extract honey from, from frames, uh, spinning them out in a, you know, a, a centrifuge extractor or the crush and strain method, which is how a lot of people start. It's how I started my first year. You know, we only had a few frames. We didn't have an extractor. We, we crushed the wax, uh, strained it out. Uh, if you spin out your frames though, it's gonna, um, require less honey to be converted to wax. So you're gonna get a bigger um, a bigger harvest overall because your bees will be using those carbs to make honey, uh, not you know, replacing wax that you're spinning out. So this is kind of a tricky one. Uh, knowing your flows and providing supplemental feed to really boost your foraging force uh, prior to that. You know, the recommendation is usually you want to start feeding six weeks before your predicted flow. Um, you know, again, this is, this, is, this is where we kind of cross the line between the art and science of beekeeping. Uh, if you've been doing this for a few years, you know, you, you've 
follow bloom dates, you, you look at what's blooming in your area. If you record that, you'll have kind of a running log, which is great. Um, I certainly would recommend you do that. You know, that look at what the major, the major crops in your area are. Talk to the local beekeepers in your kind of microclimate. Uh, and then look at your hives. Are, are your hives big and booming going into that flow? If not, you want to be preparing before that because it's going to take time for those bees to be born, you know, kind of graduate to the foraging service. Uh, so the, the recommendation is usually six weeks prior, you start feeding syrup to, to boost their numbers, to have the maximum foraging force available. Uh, Mike Palmer at one of our last meetings, or not last, but one of our former meetings, he, he gave the, the quote that population equals honey crop. And that's so true because you can have the greatest booming flow of all time, but if you've got a little weak, piddly couple frames of bees, they're not going to be able to capitalize on that. You need a real strong foraging force. You need a great flow and you need room for them to put it in. The, those are all going to be components for maximizing your honey harvest. Uh, super early and super often, that's, uh, you know, common advice given for swarm control. Uh, you know, Tom Seeley, he has shown that adding multiple supers at once versus, you know, one at a time, waiting for them to be filled and adding another one. If you add like two or three at once empty, it has been shown to stimulate the bees kind of natural hoarding tendency. Um, so it kind of ramps them up to, to really go out like en masse and start bringing that, that honey back, that nectar rather. Uh, and it, finally, if combs aren't being used properly, if you've got empty combs uh, on the edges, you know, certainly you can move those in. Um, one thing that I, I always personally look for, this was a tip I got from Ed Carl years ago. If your brood chamber has that, that couple inches of capped honey at the top of all your frames, the bees are very uh, hesitant about moving beyond that to get into your honey super. So if, I, if my frames at the top of the brood nest all have that kind of, you know, few inches band of capped honey, uh, I'll try to swap some of those out, get some empty drawn combs in the center. And then you'll see that bees are much more likely to go up into that super. Um, you know, and again, you can always rearrange the frames in the super themselves if they're only using some versus others. Uh, you know, new, new supers, uh, you may want to move a frame that has um, brood, especially if it's the proper size, you can put that up there to, to help move the bees up to start getting that, um, to start getting the bees to move up into that super. Um, but yeah, you know, you know, combs, I mean, this is one of the great reasons for using Langstroth equipment is, um, you know, it gives you such uh, flexibility um, you know, don't, don't look at these boxes as if they're monoliths, you know, unto themselves. You know, you can switch boxes between hives. You can switch the order of boxes. You can switch where the frames are. Um, you know, it really gives you a lot of flexibility and a lot of power um, to capitalize on, on a honey flow if necessary. Uh, and of course, once your, your super frames are actually drawn out, you want to take one of those, um, you know, I'm speaking here for people using 10 frame equipment, take one of those frames out. Instead of having 10 drawn frames in that super, you're going to have nine drawn frames. They'll be able to pull those frames out even fatter. Uh, and they found that you actually get more honey, uh, more volume in that than if you had the full 10 frames. And of course, you know, if you have lots of hives, you're going to be extracting fewer frames. It's easier to cut that, that fat capping off versus you know, if you've got 10 kind of, you know, poorly drawn, and now you're in there with the uh, the capping fork trying to pick that out. Yeah, I mean, we all know that's a pain in the butt. Those big fat frames, though, very easy to, to extract. So some considerations if you're going to use honey um, in some kind of product like this. I mean, this is this should be a consideration, you know, for all time, but you never want to feed sugar syrup while honey supers in place. The one caveat to that would be if you're putting a, a new super of foundation in place, you know, you can give them some supplemental feed to, to help them start drawing that out. But as soon as they, they start drawing that, if you have a flow on, you want to cut that because they'll be short storing sugar syrup in your supers instead of honey. And that's certainly not what we want. Honey, by, by, by definition, it needs to be from a floral source, not table sugar. 
Uh, you certainly don't want to be applying any medications or might treatments with honey supers in place unless the label specifically allows it. So there are a few miticides that do allow you legally by the label to use them while you have honey supers in place. Um, you know, there's MitoWay Quick Strips, there's Formic Pro, I believe HopGuard. Um, I believe the FDA is reviewing their ruling on oxalic acid. The current label though still says you can't use that with supers in place. Um, but anytime you hear a, a presenter like I'm doing now talking about when you can and can't use a, 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 a treatment in your hive, read the label. Don't listen to me because these labels do change with time. Um, you know, someone could be watching this recording five years from now and this could all be a moot point. Um, read your label, the label is the law, but you certainly don't want any of that, that material um, entering into a product that you might take internally, for instance. Uh, so heat and light are detrimental to honey's healing properties. You know, when you store your honey, uh, always kind of keep that in mind. You don't want to put it in a window. I mean, it looks great. You see the, the sunlight, you know, kind of shine through the bottles, um, but it is detrimental to their healing properties. So if you're not going to keep it in a glass jar, you know, you know, as a jar of honey, like if you're making a herbal syrup, say you want to use uh, like an amber jar and keep that out of the light, you know, put it in your pantry, um, put it in a cool place. You know, if, if you're storing it long-term, you know, there, whatever your, your product is may influence what the storage considerations are. Maybe it's the refrigerator. Uh, if it's something you're going to keep longer, you might want to keep it in the, the cellar, say in a cooler place. Uh, so correctly stored honey at the proper moisture content, which is 18.6 ish or below is basically shelf stable. But I allude to this just now, if, if you dilute it, say you're making a syrup, which is gonna have some honey and they may, maybe like an herbal tea added to it. Now you've raised the, the moisture content. So it, the shelf life is certainly gonna be different and it probably has different storage requirements. So that's something that you wanna keep in mind. Um, you know, an herbal, an herbal syrup that you make is not gonna have the same um, you know, leave it on a, uh, leave it in your cupboard for five years and it's going to be as good as it was that day. Uh, it's, it's going to be different. Um, and so again, we're, we're, we're talking about the quality of your honey. Uh, I mean, something that we've always, um, has been a sticking point is how people describe their honeys. You know, local is a term that's used, raw is a term that's used, organic, uh, raw is, is a, it's kind of got some cachet right now. Uh, I, there's no real legal definition to these terms though. So it, it kind of comes down to, um, you know, your integrity as a beekeeper, I would say. Uh, raw generally, the, the, the agreed upon definition means it hasn't been heated to uh, temperatures above what you might normally find in a hive and it's minimally strained. So if you, you know, the, the reason people want raw honey is they want that, like the, the pollen grains in it, you know, they want something that wasn't overly processed. But I can tell you that even if you do strain your honey through, through, you know, a, a fairly fine mesh, it is still going to contain those pollen grains. So I think some people, they, they use the, the raw label as an excuse for putting on a sloppy product. There's no need for that. You don't need to have wax flakes floating in there bee parts, other debris, that just makes it, it makes it look ugly and sloppy um, because your strain honey is still gonna contain those pollen grains. Um, th this is a slide. Um, we as a club, we submitted, I think about 15 samples of, of our local honeys to be DNA tested for the pollen content. This was from my yard last year. Um, I do strain my honey. I, I consider it raw, but I strain it through through mesh as you know, kind of the final process before it gets bottled. And you can see on this chart here all the, the various um, pollen types that were identified in it. Uh, it also it did give us the, the volume of the pollen and whether it was strained minimally or like basically what we can do as kind of backyard beekeepers, you've still got the, that pollen grain. Uh, 
um, in there. So that's not an excuse for putting out sloppy honey. Any questions on honey before I move on to beeswax? Okay, guys, I'm barreling through. That's a nice looking frame. So what wax is, workers, they produce wax flakes from their wax glands. Uh, you know, approximately nine to 17 days old, depending on what, what referencing, what reference you're studying. Um, you know, some people kind of hedge their bet and go in the middle at 12 days old, but it's an amazing product. I mean, the bees make this, you know, it's, it's the complete architecture of the hive and the bees make it themselves. So the entire nest is composed of wax. All, every, everything that they store, the brood, the honey, the pollen, um, when they go out foraging for water, you know, to cool the hive, that's all stored in wax. Um, so any cavities, you know, in your, in your hive that are larger than bee space, that's an approximate three eighths of an inch, they'll fill with wax. Uh, you know, when, when they're putting wax, we're in a, in a place that we as beekeepers don't want it, we call it bear comb. Uh, any smaller crevices, they're gonna fill with propolis. So when you put your, you know, put a feeder jar on in the spring, you put a big deep over it to cover it. You forget about it for two weeks, you come back and the flow now is on and the whole thing is all full of bear comb. You've seen this quality exhibited. Uh, so some health and beauty uses. It's great in lip balms, salves, body scrubs, creams, lotion bars. Uh, you know, this is kind of one of the ma major um, ways that we're gonna use high products. That there's a lot of opportunity here and a lot of variety. Uh, it holds fatty oils and an emulsion and creams and lotions. So, you know, th those oils won't uh, separate out. It'll stay as a homogenous kind of mixture. It's moisturizing, it's emollient. So it adds moisture, it keeps your skin soft and, and smooth, supple. It also forms a protective barrier. So it keeps moisture in, um, you know, and obviously we know that it's used in uh, waterproofing and other, in other contexts. Uh, it could also be used for pomades, you know, beard, uh, beard styling products, things like that, hair styling products. So some harvest considerations. Wax will darken with age. Um, you know, the, the more bees move over it, the darker it gets. Uh, certainly if it's ever used for brood, cocoons build up in there, that darkens it. So for like your really fine, like uh, what I would consider like a high-end cosmetic or something you're gonna put on your face, uh, you wanna use really your best quality cappings, uh, which are like the new white wax from newly drawn frames. And that's what we have on the, on the left here. That's an extracted frame, brand new wax that was surely, you know, drawn that year. That's going to be your best quality um, for that kind of stuff. Um, wax foundation, I mean, basically all wax foundation that you're going to get from the major manufacturers are going to contain some traces of pesticides. Uh, it's, it's one of the, the properties of wax. It acts like a sponge in the environment and it, it will uh, attract those, um, those residues. So if you're using it for something, again, like something that you would use like on your face, like a lip balm, something like that. Uh, if that's a concern for you, you wanna not use wax foundation probably, um, you know, maybe harvest foundationless frames. Uh, I would certainly avoid collecting from brood chambers, uh, you know, for the reasons I mentioned before that they could potentially contain um, pesticide residue from from foragers or miticide residues from past mite treatments that you use. Um, but you know, you can you can still use that wax, collect it and use it, just save it for things like candles, furniture polish, you know, other uses. You know, and you, you wanna ho hopefully try to keep that stuff separate when you're, you know, if you're scraping out boxes or whatever, you know, you can have one for like the nice new, you know, white wax and then one for the older stuff that you're gonna use for more like household products. Uh, captured swarms are a great way to uh, draw wax out. If you are lucky enough to capture a swarm, you know, you put a box of foundation on there. Um, they're, they're young bees, the proper age, their wax glands are gonna be um, 
active that they know that they're moving into a box that now they are going to have to draw all that wax out. So they're the proper age bees. Um, you know, their honey stomachs are, are going to be full of honey or nectar from, from the, the hive that swarmed. It's, it's like a perfect storm to get that wax drawn out. So even if you have equipment uh, with already drawn comb, if I ever catch a, a swarm, I always try to put a super of foundation on top of it to get that drawn out for me. Uh, you know, and regular replacement of, of honeycomb is recommended for bee health. So you don't need to feel too bad about harvesting some of this. Uh, you know, and you can, you can do this on a, you know, whatever kind of schedule you come up with, you know, take two frames out of each box every season or what have you. Uh, you know, the recommendations kind of vary. I've, I've heard some people say re remove it all after three years. That gets a little hard to keep track of. But if you're always kind of taking some out, you know, like take the, the outer frames, you know, then move them out, put some new foundation in the middle. You'll always kind of be continually replacing not a whole box at once, but a few frames every year. And you'll keep that regular, um, that regular rotation of comb to keep the, the pesticide, you know, and potential virus level down in the hive. Uh, and it's estimated that one to two pounds of wax cappings are going to remain after harvesting 100 pounds of honey. So uh, this is a pretty precious product. Uh, unless you're harvesting frames directly for the wax, you're not probably going to get a ton, um, you know, just, just as part of the, the honey harvest uh, itself. Um, you know, so, so use it wisely. Oh, and I actually can't see this because of the Because of the uh, zoom controls here, I, but I believe this is uh, a note that when I mentioned honey earlier as being the kind of the main component of wax, um, it, it's going to be a, a trade off. Are you collecting honey? Or are you collecting wax? Um, you know, if, if you want to collect a lot of wax, that reduces the space available for honey storage. They're also going to need to use that honey to build more wax. So it's always going to be kind of a trade off. Uh, probably none of us here are harvesting wax in those kinds of quantities where this is going to make, you know, a huge difference, but something to keep in mind. Pollen. So this is the, the uh, bottom of a pollen trap, and these are all the different colors here. Um, you know, you probably know this, but each color kind of corresponds to whatever floral source they collected this from. Uh, and there are cool charts that you can find online. There are books also that, that will show the colors um, what the potential floral source of those pollens are. Uh, and again, now this is the same thing, but stored in, in cells. And you can see the, the various uh, colors here. You know, some of this, this blue stuff, I would assume is going to be Siberian squill, which we are always excited to see coming in in the spring. So pollen is the only source of dietary proteins and lipids in the bees diet. Um, so unlike Unlike nectar, which is the, the carbohydrate source, pollen is the, the protein source. It also does have kind of trace amounts of carbohydrate, but its major function is for, for proteins. Uh, the, the, collecting, the collected pollen is mixed with glandular secretions, small, amount, small amounts of nectar. They store it in cells as bee bread, which is what we're looking at here. Uh, so bee bread, it's different than pollen. Um, the, the, secretions, it prevents the pollen itself from germinating. Uh, it, it, it's kind of a fermentation process. So it, it allows it to be stored for longer periods of time. It prevents it from germinating. Uh, and it also, it, it's sort of like a pre-digestion, uh, which sounds kind of gross, but it's like, you know, they're gonna be using this to feed, um, feed brood. So it's like, they kind of start the digestive process um, as a function of making the bee bread to kind of make it uh, a quicker process, in other words. Uh, so that's nurse bees, they consume the bee bread. Uh, and nurse bees are really the only bees that eat pollen in the hive. Uh, they convert that protein into royal jelly or worker jelly, you know, using those, those glands in their head, the uh, hypopharyngeal gland, the mandibular gland. And I mean, this is the, the big one, no pollen, no brood. So when you're opening a hive and you are uh, assessing the, the 
the health of the colony. If you see no pollen in there, you're not going to see brood being born. You're probably going to see older brood being cannibalized for that protein. Um, you know, queens will shut down. Um, so it's something we always want to keep in mind, you know, both in the harvest of pollen, but in our general um, hive health checks as well. This is a jar of collected pollen from Sarah. Um, the way I mainly use it, which really is not a health or beauty use, but I collect pollen to feed back to the bees when pollen is, is either light or I'm not seeing a lot of it in the hive. Um, that's when I like to collect pollen. Uh, it's also consumed directly by humans as a health supplement, you know, and that can be sprinkled on oatmeal, mixed into smoothies. Um, you know, it's, its main attraction is, is protein, and that percentage of protein in the pollen varies by floral type. You know, it's, I believe, usually in the 8 to 40 percent range, depending on the floral type. Um, you know, we're collecting kind of mixed wildflower um, pollen, so you're you're going to get a different a different mix of of what the protein co uh, content is there, whether you're eating it yourself or feeding it to your bees. Um, but again, you know, kind of the the same way in a human diet, even something healthy isn't necessarily healthy if it's all you eat. You want a balanced diet, so it's nice to get. Um, you know, not maybe like a monofloral pollen when you're feeding your bees, you, you like to see that, that different color, I do. Um, but pollen use for humans, uh, other than like as for protein, it, it gets a lot of um, anecdotal support, but there's very little like hard science behind it. Uh, so I would, kind of tread lightly on this. Um, you know, placebo effect is a real thing. Uh, if you eat pollen, if you have friends that eat pollen and they swear by it, I wouldn't necessarily try to talk them out of it, but you'll hear people make a lot of kind of grandiose claims about what pollen can do for human health. Uh, I would just say the jury is out on that. Uh, and part of the reason is because, you know, there's not a lot of good, you know, like university led um, peer reviewed studies on this, you know, when we're dealing with natural products like this, it's a lot harder to get kind of a control, um, versus something that was created in a lab where every batch is exactly the same every time. Like that, that jar of honey that, I mean, uh, that jar of pollen there, you know, it's got lots of different pollens in there, different sources. Um, you know, does the, the protein content go up or down with the amount of moisture we had that year? It's like, there's a lot of stuff in play, uh, and it makes these like hard studies uh, more difficult to, to do. So we don't have a lot of great science on that. So I would just, um, again, avoid making kind of boastful claims about what pollen can do for you. So as far as harvesting, uh, I mean, it's generally done with a pollen trap. Um, there are a few different kinds there. The one I use, uh, it's this one on the right here by Better Bee. So pretty cheap plastic job. It mounts to the front of the hive. Uh, and basically what it is, is it's like a, a entrance reducer where the bees have to go through smaller entrances and it brushes the pollen load off their back legs. There'll be a tray underneath to collect it. Uh, and the nice thing about that is you can kind of leave it in place all year. And the the little entrance screen you can flip up or down when you want to collect. If you want to collect, you put it down, the bees have to go through. When you don't want to collect, you can lift it up and the bees can go through unimpeded. Uh, well, what I usually do is I put it on at night, like the night before. I leave the entrance open, it gets the bees used to going in and out of that. Then like the next day I'll put it down. Now they're forced to go through. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily leave those on uh, for a long period of time, like the plastic ones, especially, they have a lot of like molding um, cavities in them that could har uh, harbor small high beetle uh, if you leave them in place full time. Um, on the left is a Sundance pollen trap, which are really recommended as kind of the, the best quality. And there are a few different models of that.
I mean, you could also make a pollen trap with uh, hardware cloth. That's how they, they did it before, you know, they had these kind of mass produced versions. Um, so some considerations, pollen may contain pesticide residue. Uh, so again, if you're, if you're eating it yourself, if you're feeding it to your bees, that's always going to be kind of a concern. You know, if, if honeybees are foraging on nectar that um, was con contaminated with pesticide, there's a good chance they're not going to make it back to the hive because they're consuming that honey internally. You know, and even though they're holding it in their honey stomach, if the pesticide level is, is high enough, if it's, um, you know, if, if it's poisonous enough to the honeybee, they probably won't make it back to the hive to contaminate, you know, the stores in the hive. The pollen, on the other hand, they're storing on the outsides of their legs. So, you know, their mouth parts may come in contact with it at some point, but it's not going to have the same um, potential for poisoning. So you're probably more likely to see uh, pesticide residue in pollens coming back than with honey. So again, just something to keep in mind. Uh, you, you never want to over harvest from a single hive. Uh, you know, they can, when when they see the, the pollen level dropping, if you have a pollen trap on and all of a sudden you're trapping, you know, the, the majority of pollen coming in the hive, they will um, activate more foragers for pollen specifically. They won't just let the pollen incoming drop to zero. They, they will divert, um, say, nectar foragers or other house bees to now become uh, pollen foragers. But you're kind of throwing off the balance of the hive when you do that. So you want to put it on maybe like two or three days at a time, um, you know, swap it around to other hives, maybe not always go to the same hive, although some hives are, you know, they, they will harvest pollen preferentially, um, you know, and that, that could be like a genetic thing. Uh, you want to dry pollen before freezing. Uh, specifically, if you're going to feed it back to bees, um, Dr. Heather Madela found that freezing, if you freeze the pollen straight from the trap, the eventual desirability to the bee is diminished. So she recommended always um, drying it first. So like I'll, I'll lay it out on kind of a thin piece of um, wax paper, my dehydrator, and it doesn't take very long. Um, like you don't want to uh, dry it to the point that it it's completely desiccated, um, but you want to reduce some of that, that moisture content in there. And it should be kept in the freezer long-term. Uh, allergies obviously should be a major concern. If, if this is something that you plan to uh, use internally or sell to someone, I would be very um, concerned with the possibility for someone allergic to one of the pollens, you know, in my jar now trying to eat that. Uh, so again, this is something that you want to look at as far as liability to you goes. Um, you know, if, if you're, if you're sharing this among friends and family, this is probably not going to be a, a major issue, but would you want to be selling that out at the end of your driveway at a farm stand? Um, something to keep in mind. Uh, and you want to empty those traps at least every two or three days. And certainly more often if it's humid or wet out because mold can grow on trap pollen. Propolis, I really didn't have a great image of propolis, but um, this I'll get back to this image in a second here. This is actually a, a, a propolis forager here. Uh, and you can see that ball, it looks sort of like the shape of, of a, uh, a pollen pellet. But you'll, you'll see this very rarely in your highs. It's this kind of sticky, wet looking, and it's usually like a kind of orangish, amberish, um, brownish color. Uh, and there are not a lot of propolis foragers in a hive. I, I think Heather Madela said it's something like for every hundred uh, pollen foragers, you're gonna have one propolis forager. Um, so whenever we see one, I always think it's kind of a you know, it's like catching a, a, a shooting star. Like it's just not something that you see all that often, which is cool. So what is what is propolis? It, essentially, it's plant resins that foragers collect from tree buds. Uh, and there was some thought in the past that the forager actually contributes something, again, like glandular secretions or enzymes when they collect it. But 
Dr. Marla Spivak's uh, research has shown, essentially it's, it's a product the bees just collect, they don't change. Uh, it may have some incidental, um, you know, say saliva uh, in it, but it, that doesn't change the product. Um, the product itself comes from the tree, the bee just collects it. So they, how they use it, any cracks or crevices narrower than bee space, about three eighths of an inch, they're gonna fill with propolis. Uh, entrances may be reduced or closed up completely. If you have ventilation holes, sometimes they'll close them completely. I'm gonna bounce back to that earlier photo. This is actually a five frame nuke. And what I did was on the right here, you can see the, the entrance, which was about a 2B entrance. And then the rest was a piece of window screen. So, it, you know, my thought was, oh, it's the middle of summer. This is a nuke in a big exposed area. It's got the sun beating on it all day. I'm going to, I'm going to use a piece of window screen across the whole five frame entrance. So they'll get all the ventilation that they need, but still be protected from robbing because it's only a, a two, a two B opening, but you can see they completely cemented over the entire um, surface of the screen. They knew better than I did. I mean, no surprise there, but it was like a cool, uh, a cool example of them actually using it the way you read in books, which is something you don't always get. Propolis has been called like an antimicrobial doormat for the hive. Uh, so they, they kind of create this propolis envelope inside, you know, like a tree cavity or inside your, your wooden hiveware. Uh, it will also be across kind of the, the landing board. And it's, it's kind of um, like into a doormat. So bees are out in the world. They're potentially uh, collecting bacteria, uh, maybe virus particles as they uh, interact with other flowers that other bees have been on. That propolis layer is thought to kind of be a way to kind of slump some of that off as they return back to the hive. And something that we all learn in bee school, it can also be used to seal off infectious material. So a bee, a, a, a mouse gets in the hive, uh, you know, guard bees may sting it to death, but they can't physically remove that dead mouse from the hive now. They will mummify it in propolis to keep it protected, uh, to keep that infectious material, in other words, from being able to infect the rest of the hive. And something you, you may see, you, you, not a lot of people have heard of this necessarily, but something called entombed pollen, where if, um, say, pollen with pesticide residue does get brought back to the hive, if the bees sense that, they will put a thin layer of propolis over it as like a way to kind of seal it off. Uh, and that, that's called entombed pollen. Uh, and, and again, it's a way to use that um, to keep infectious material from coming into contact with, with the rest of the bees in the hive. And it does appear, uh, according to Marla Spivak's research, that bees can actually use propolis to self-medicate. Uh, so she found propolis foraging actually went up after a chalk brood infection, uh, which is pretty amazing that through some kind of faculty they have, they know that, you know, we have sick bees in this hive. We're going to now go out and collect more propolis um, kind of as a way to fight that. I, I mean, I find that absolutely fascinating. And it does also have uh, some action against American fowl brood, I believe. Not, not everything um, that the bees encounter responds to uh, propolis, but uh, pretty cool nonetheless. So how do we use it? This is another... Um, photo that Sarah was kind enough to share with us, uh, this honey propolis throw spray. Uh, we actually got some of this from her at the last December meeting and uh, my wife and I both really liked it. So it, it has antifungal, antibacterial, antiviral properties. It's like very, very strong stuff. It's great smelling. Um, to me, that is the smell of the hive. Like when you open up a, a, a beehive and you get that that kind of spicy, warm scent, it, you know, it, some, yeah, some of it is the wax, some of it is 
the honey, but to me, it's the propolis. If you smell a chunk of propolis, that's it. Like that's, you know, it's most concentrated form. Um, so that could be used in, um, you know, incense, uh, anything that you want to smell good. I mean, throat sprays and oral rinses are like a really common way that propolis is used. Um, you know, and so great, great shot here from Sarah. Uh, can also be added to soaps, lip balms, any kind of other cosmetics. Um, it's used in burns, cuts, scrapes. Again, so a lot of these products you're going to kind of use maybe in combination. So adding propolis, uh, say to like a honey ointment used for, um, you know, scrapes or cuts would be like kind of a smart uh, bit of synergy here. Uh, and now something that we don't always think of health uses, but health uses for bees, uh, you know, again, Spivak recommends painting the inside of new woodenware with a propolis tincture as like a way to support bee health. And she, she is really kind of the, the giant behind propolis research. Um, I, I would certainly recommend you look up some of her YouTube videos. I'm sure you can see her whole talk on propolis up there, um, but she's done so much great research on this. Um, you know, and again, there, there are formulas you can find. Obviously, we have to kind of gloss over some of this stuff for the space of this talk. But if you if you make like a, a tincture of propolis, you know, a, a layer of propolis in the bottom of a jar, I kind of use kind of a folk formula of one part item, two parts, um, you know, alcohol over it and just use like a cheap throwaway brush. A anything that you use with propolis is going to get yellow and be unusable for anything else, but a cheap throwaway brush, paint the inside of your equipment. And it'll kind of give the bees a, a leg up on collecting. Um, so how do we harvest propolis? This is a, a propolis trap. Uh, it looks similar to a queen excluder, uh, but basically what, the, what this is, is you put this on top of a hive. It's got all these little slots. The bees fill that with propolis you take it inside, put it in a freezer, and then you can kind of flex it. It's plastic, so it'll flex, and all the pieces will, will crack off. I mean, I can tell you from, from experience today, even uh, a day that, we'll, you know, we certainly weren't at freezing temperatures, uh, but I was cleaning some queen excluders today, scraping the propolis off of there, and even on a day like today, it's so brittle uh, that it just it flakes right off very easily. Uh, and of course you can certainly scrape it out of your boxes. Uh, lots of people do remove it as part of, you know, their kind of daily inspections, uh, but some considerations. I would avoid harvesting it from brew chambers for the same reason I would avoid using beeswax from brew chambers. Uh, the possibility of miticides or pesticides coming into contact with that. Uh, and this isn't something that I know um, you know, I, I don't have like a, a, a study that I can point you to that says propolis from brew chambers containing pesticides got someone sick. But from an overabundance of caution, it's something I would want to keep in mind. Uh, don't over harvest. A little goes a long way. Like you really don't need a ton of propolis if you're if you're planning on making like a propolis tincture to use for like oral uh, oral health you don't need a ton of it. So you don't need to harvest a lot of it, um, especially because it does have health benefits to the colony. Uh, so really the recommendation now is to leave as much of it in the pl in place as possible. Um, yes, we do scrape some of it out, you know, where, where frames uh, meet the boxes, the frame rests, where frames meet other frames. You know, I try to keep that kind of clear. Um, but like certainly the insides of boxes, I'd never scrape the propolis out of the insides of boxes. Um, the tops of frames, like I just, I leave it in place if I can. Um, you know, and again, this, this goes back to Spivax talk. Um, you know, they were even looking at breeding bees that use more propolis. And that is something you will see. You know, we probably, if you've been keeping bees for a little bit of time, um, you know, you got three or four hives in the backyard, you'll see that one hive all of a sudden one year, they are just gaga over propolis. And every time you pull it open, it's just like a box of taffy, uh, which, you know, for a beekeeper is not the most 
fun. Um, like I don't like to wear gloves, but when I have that that hive that really goes crazy with propolis, I put gloves on just because it's easier than you know scraping it all off my hands at the end of the day. So propolis should be kept in the freezer until you process it, you know, into whatever form you're going to use it as. And she found that, you know, that those active properties were really um, best, you know, best stable within a, a year of collection. You know, so if you have like a jar of propolis uh, scrapings out in your garage for like the last five years, it's probably okay to just toss that now and start over. Uh so here's something um, for those of us who do collect propolis. You have to dissolve it in a, a solvent. Uh, you know, generally that's going to be vodka or uh, Everclear grain alcohol. I use grain alcohol because it's a higher alcohol content, dissolves a little faster. It takes a while. Like it's probably going to take you a good two weeks. Uh, but something that I have found again through personal use was in the first years we'd start scraping propolis off and you know it's sticky so what do you do you, you kind of ball it all together as you're going you know and now you get to the the last hive out of your four or five or six hives that you have and you got like a big golf ball of propolis well and then you drop that in a jar of everclear and it takes six months for the thing to dissolve if you just scrape all the loose scrapings into a little container and then throw them in the jar, it dissolves much, much faster. You get way more uh, surface area in contact with the solvent. Um, so I really try to avoid now that that um, kind of propensity that we all have when we're scraping propolis out of a hive to, to, to wad it all together. Cause it just, it makes it a chore to use um, for those of us who do, do use it. Uh, if you're not gonna tincture it in, in a solvent like alcohol, uh, you know, and there, there are times where even if you're gonna use this internally, you may not wanna have alcohol. Um, you could use a dedicated spice grinder uh, to make a powdered propolis that you can use in those, those applications. Uh, our last speaker last month, Landy, uh, Landy Simone, she has actually a great um, presentation that you can find online where she goes through the whole process of, you know, cleaning propolis, um, separating it out in a freezer, putting that in a, a, a again, this has to be a dedicated spice grinder because you're never going to get it clean once you put the propolis in there. Um, but then you can use it just kind of raw as a powder instead of, you know, suspended in alcohol. Um, and it really is very widely used outside of America. In, in America, unless you're a beekeeper or you know, if you're into herbal healing, you're, you're probably not going to be very familiar with propolis, but outside of that, it has really a good reputation um, for its healing properties. But because of that, when you're looking for, you know, good reference material on it, a lot of it is unfortunately not published in English. Um, so again, I kind of look at it the way I look at pollen. Um, I mean, I do personally use, use propolis, but I really try to avoid those, um, you know, the hyperbole that you'll hear a lot of people attach to it, where they'll say, basically, it'll, it'll cure everything, you know, it'll cure cancer. Um, you know, it's, that's anecdotal. Um, okay, so some final thoughts on whatever you guys are, are using here. You never want to make medical claims. I mean, this, this hopefully, um, doesn't even need explanation, but we're beekeepers. Uh, you get into a really dicey situation um, when you move beyond a product meant to be used as like a, a supplement or you know a, even a soap. Uh, when you start to say this is now a, a he an eczema healing soap, that has become a drug at this point and. Legally, I mean, uh, you know, and the FDA regulations on that are completely different. Uh, and again, we're, we're not doctors, unless you are a doctor and you've gone through the process of doing this, you never want to make medical claims. Um, and again, I, I kind of mentioned this all through the talk, but th these products really are amazing just as they are. Uh, you don't need to use like a lot of hyperbole and, and overblown uh, 
talk to, to, to sell the stuff to people. Uh, it, it's great stuff. Um, you know, so avoid that, you know, avoid sharing the memes that you find on Facebook, you know, or people send you on Instagram. Um, does this stuff have, have healing properties? Yes. But you know, it, it doesn't take the place. If you, if your leg gets cut off, you don't put honey salve on it. You go to a surgeon. Uh, you uh, really want to do your homework regarding labeling and regulations. You know, we're lucky. Um, honey is really, it's almost like an honor system. Um, you know, as far as labeling goes in America, we're really lucky in that regard. Like we don't need to have certified kitchens. You know, we don't have inspections of, you know, of our product unless we're like, you know, selling hundreds of thousands of tons of honey a year. Uh, but other products are going to have specific labeling and reg regulations attached to them. If you're adding anything to honey, say, uh, you know, once it's not just strictly honey, if you're infusing it with, with fruit or hot peppers or something like that, that's no longer strictly honey. And that has a much different labeling um, requirements and regulations as far as how you're processing it, uh, what kind of kitchen you use. So tread very lightly on that. Um, and again, this is more from like a business standpoint. If you're doing this for friends and family, you know, unless your, your uncle is like super litigious and doesn't like you very much, you can probably get away with it. Um, so again, I mean, for me, your, your reputation, you're putting your name on your product. Um, it, to me, it's much easier to keep your reputation intact to begin with rather than have to repair it after, uh, you know, someone bought a jar of something, the, the honey had fermented, it wasn't what they wanted, the, the jar blew up. Um, you know, you can guarantee that person is going to be dragging you through the mud all throughout social media. Every person they talk to, every time beekeeping comes up, your name is going to be on their lips. You never want to be in that position. Take the precautions you need, uh, you know, from the beginning to keep your rep reputation intact. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of like your virginity, like you have it until you don't have it your reputation, you might be able to get back your virginity, obviously not, but uh, easier to keep it than to uh, deal with it after the fact. Uh, for those of you who do uh, want to play with this stuff, and I, I encourage you all to, to investigate it because it, it's just an, a fun and interesting side project, especially this time of year where we're not doing day-to-day -day bee stuff. So now you make like a, a batch of lip balm, or some hand cream or whatever. And it's, it's like the best you've ever used. It's better than anything you can buy in a store. Well, now everyone in your family wants it. How do you make that batch again? Hopefully you kept really good records. Hopefully you weighed all your ingredients. You can do a lot of this with kind of folk, folk recipes uh, and it'll still work to some degree. It, it'll still be useful to some degree, but if you want to have uh, reproducible uh, results, and consistent results. You really get to weigh everything, you know, get yourself a, a digital scale. They're not expensive, write things down, um, you know, and then if something, you, you know, if something isn't exactly right, you can kind of go back to that recipe and say, well, you know what, let, let me try adding a few drops of this scent. And now you have a, a better place to work from versus, you know, just the kind of old grandma throwing things in a pot, make a bowl of soup. Um, Oh, and again, Zoom is gonna Zoom is gonna cover this last uh, thing for me here. Oh, so so here is something I see, especially with Facebook. Someone makes their first their first candle, and. God bless you guys. Uh, look, we've all been there. You're proud of it, but you can see every imperfection in that candle. Y you know, the wick is the wrong size. It's like coming out two inches out of the side. You know, it's not full up. It's got all kind of bloom all over it, but it's at the end of this guy's driveway now with the price tag on it. Wait till you get a good product that you can really stand behind, that you're really proud to put your name on. 
you know, give give the the kind of trial stuff, the the beta tests to your friends, your family. There's there's no shame in that. Certainly, they're not going to judge you. But if you're going to do this um, in, in any kind of a a business way, you know, everyone out there, everyone in this group can make these products. It's not that special. To make something really fantastic is special, though, uh, and that's what's going to separate you from the people who are just. If you're doing stuff for fun, then do it for fun all day long. Um, but if you want to you know, start charging for this, really put in the, the, the time, the effort um, to make the best product you can, respect your ingredients, you know, and respect your, your customers. And that's all I have. Um, thank you guys. There are some uh, recommended reading on here. Uh, Two Million Blossoms, if you want to know anything about honey, um, you know, Kirsten Trainer, who has presented to us on a few occasions, she literally wrote the book. Uh, and a lot of this is about honey's healing properties specifically. So if you have any questions about that, the science behind it, it's in there. Uh, as far as actual product recipes, these two books by Petra Anhart, Anhart, I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce that, Beeswax Alchemy and Beehive Alchemy. She's got, you know, all the the lip balms, the hand salves, and then all the other stuff too. Um, you know, those wax food wraps, uh, furniture polishes, things of that nature. Uh, the complete guide to making mead, beeswax, but almost any book you read, um, the hive and the honeybee has so much background info on this stuff. Um, there's a ton of reading out there. So our, our collection is at the Greenville Public Library. I would encourage you to all to all take a look at that.